wonder if this mic can be moved, but I won't take that risk right now. Um, hi, everybody. Good evening. Thank you so much for spending Tuesday night with us. Uh, I'm Smitha. I'm uh, the program co-chair. And today, we wanted to kind of um, remind everybody that it's uh, almost election season time, right? You can actually go out now, and it's time for midterm elections. And in that vein, um, kind of think about who are the people uh, thinking about the interaction between government and citizens. So today, we have three speakers who will be sharing their experience at, in different organizations in the government, um, and they'll introduce themselves. And they have a small presentation to kind of share a little bit about their background, their work, what is the impact design and design thinking is having. And then we'll open it up for QA, we'll have a discussion, and yeah, we'll go from there. So Gail, we'll start off with you. Okay. I guess my mic will stay on then, okay. Um, you can actually use that mic, but your presentation is here, so. Okay. So you don't have to like lean over and speak. Yeah. Okay, okay, cool. So should I use that mic? Okay, I'm really bad at this, so how do I make this go? Present. Um, I just do. How's everybody doing? <laughs> Good? So, so today for me is E minus 28, meaning that's 28 more days until election day. So um, vote by mail ballots were actually sent out today because yesterday was a postal holiday. So anybody here a vote by mail voter? Yeah? So you'll be getting your ballots in the mail uh, shortly. So my name is Gail Pellerin. I'm the Santa Cruz County Clerk Registrar of Voters. And um, I'm here today because of Nancy. And um, she was um, somebody who worked with us on basically redesigning our voting materials so it improves the voter experience. So part of it was learning how to be very crystal clear and using plain language on um, explaining things to voters, because elections can be very complicated. So the things that I learned and, and try to implement in everything I do in the election world is, is logical organization, always using the active voice, common everyday words, short sentences, using the you as a pronoun, uh, lists and tables, uh, easy to read design features, uh, easy to find information, um, using symbols and icons and graphics, and having lots of white space as well. And uh, having short paragraphs is very important. You don't really want a page where there's so much gray that somebody feels overwhelmed with it. Trying to keep your topics to, to one per paragraph and, and aim for no more than seven lines uh, in a paragraph. So we had some really dense materials in our elections office and you know, trying to explain things to voters. And using these basic tools really helped us to organize more and make things easier for voters to understand. And the other plus of this is that when you do use plain language, it's also easier to translate into other languages. So uh, that's been a real plus. In our county, unlike Santa Clara County, or uh, some of these counties have multiple languages. I think LA is up to 13 or so, or 14. We just have uh, English only is, is our, uh, all of our ballots, but we do provide a lot of materials in Spanish. And we are now doing some in Tagalog and Chinese as well, but it's very limited. So um, nothing is done in the elections world without a village. It takes a, a team to put everything together. So we worked very closely with the Center for Civic Design. And uh, in this photo here, there's Dana Chisnell, who's uh, one of the founders of the Center for Civic Design, along with Whitney Cuisenberry. So we work very closely with them. Uh, the other people in the picture are from the League of Women Voters, and that's another great partnership that we've developed over the years. They've done a lot in the area of plain language and voter education. And um, together, we are also part of this Future of California Elections Collaborative. Um, so Center for Civic Design is not part of that, but they're a partner in that uh, collaborative. But it's basically five different county registrars, along with voting rights activist groups, including ACLU, uh, Naleo, Disability Rights California, Common Cause, League of Women Voters. Um, so um, CalPerg, I mean, so we really try to touch uh, on all the different aspects of people who are involved in the elections process, 
uh, verified voting is another one. And when we first gathered and met, like I think it's like five years ago now, or maybe more, um, it was a room of people that were sort of at odds, and we were a little bit afraid of each other. Uh, in fact, some, in some cases, ACLU sues us sometimes, so we've been adversaries in court as well. But we found a lot of common ground, and, and one thing we're all very passionate about is, is engaging voters and improving the voter experience. So together, we've done a lot of redesigning of our, project, of our materials. One key one was the voter guide redesign. Um, so did you guys get your state voter guide already? It has this picture of the flag on the front. So that's actually gone through a lot of revisions. You'll see the first part of the state voter guide uh, tells you pretty clearly who supports it and who's against it. And um, there's also a voter bill of rights that was totally rewritten using plain language. And another thing that the state did, has anybody missed the ballot text from the voter guide? Did anybody realize that the actual text of the state propositions is no longer printed and delivered to your home? So it tells you that if you want the text of the measures, you have to go online to get it or contact your elections official and they'll mail you a copy because it's an entirely separate guide now and not automatically mailed to every household. And then our county voter information guide, we've done a lot of revisions on that. We started with just wanting to do the cover and now it's become everything. Uh, we also did a vote by mail ballot redesign. So in our county, we have 154,000 registered voters. And as of today, I'm uh, 100,400 voters have requested a vote by mail ballot. So it is definitely becoming the popular way for people to vote. And in fact, there are five counties that have moved to what's called a vote center model, where every voter in the county is automatically mailed a ballot. And, and then they set up these vote centers 10 days prior to the election based on the number of registered voters. And then the four days prior to the election, they have to up that number. And it basically allows voters to go to any location to vote a ballot. So you have ballot printing on demand at all these locations. They can go and vote on a, a, an accessible unit. The vote center models also require you to have a remote accessible ballot so a person with a dis disability can vote independently and privately from their home. And then on top of that, you have to have these um, vote by mail ballot drop boxes throughout the county. And um, so those are real convenient for voters because they can just drive up or walk up and drop off their ballot and um, never any postage required. We've been paying our postage for the vote by mail returns for a couple years now, but I know some counties have not been doing that. But the law just recently changed, so all voters in the state beginning in 2019 will have vote by mail ballots with paid postage. So vote by mail is a big, big issue and redesigning that and making it more user friendly. Another huge change in law was same day voter registration, where a voter who misses the deadline to register to vote, which is on October 22nd, that's the deadline to make sure you're registered and that your name will appear on the roster of voters. But if you miss that deadline, you can still register and vote up to and including election day, but it just has to be at, a set, at one of the designated locations. So it's kind of a complicated law, and, and I worked with a group of people in trying to communicate and come up with the best tools and best messages on how to let people know about that. And then we have a number of voter receipts that we have to provide voters. So I'm going to show you a couple of differences here. So this is our uh, county voter guide redesign. The old cover, not so bad actually, but um, and, actually, and that was actually a revision from my really old one. But uh, the one on the right is the new cover that we worked on with the Center for Civic Design. It's just it's more friendly to the eye. It's it, the information's grouped together better with the shading, and it's just an easier cover to to follow and understand what's happening. Um, we also got rid of the word like pamphlet. People don't really, you know, understand, you know, that, what that. So we changed that to guide instead of pamphlet. Um, and then uh, local measures. This is a big change for us. So our old way of doing the measure, and we did this through usability testing with with uh, people who actually are reading this material and what what are they looking for. So yeah, they're looking for the ballot question. You know, what measure is it? What's the letter? What jurisdiction? What's the ballot question? And then they're, they're, everyone, what they want to know is what does a yes vote mean and what does a no vote mean? So we are actually now pull that out and put that on the first page uh, about that measure. We actually, I actually did that before the law changed, allowing me to do that. But uh, I'm elected in my county, so I kind of get to do a few things creatively sometimes. But we did work on getting that law changed, so now I'm legal. And, um, and then below that, who supports it and who's against it? 
So for and against. And that's what voters were really wanting to get. And the old method, what we did, we had the ballot question, and we went right into the ballot text. All that legal verbiage about what that measure does. People don't want that, you know, so uh, they want the more simple version of what we're doing now. So that's been a real hit with voters. So our old vote by mail ballot envelope. So this was our old envelope. We do bilingual. Um, having a voter signature on an envelope is imperative because without a signature, I cannot count the ballot. And there are tools available to us where we can gather that signature and cure the ballot post uh, after the election. But uh, we really want to try to get that up front. So this was the, the design we had going into the redesign, which actually worked pretty well. I mean, we do have it bright red. We have arrows. People's eyes were drawn to that to sign it. So we redesigned the envelope in June 2018 to look like this. And we had a problem, actually. Uh, we did user test this, but um, in the real world, we had 367 voters who did not sign the envelope. That's the largest number we've ever had. So this is just showing you a design idea that was tested and verified, and everybody loved it. And when we actually deployed it, it was not a huge success. So um, the, some of the issues we had, I don't know if you could read this, but at the very top, it was an authorization to authorize somebody else to return your envelope for you. And people saw that and thought, that's not me. And they just ignored the rest of the envelope. So uh, again, there, there's a lot of material, a lot of information we have to put on this envelope so people understand what their rights are and what they're signing. And a lot of this is mandated by law. So what we did now is we've redesigned that and what is our new and improved design. So everybody see where you sign? Is that clear now? OK, so it's a better. Uh, we got arrows at the top to draw people's eyes down that look below. And we moved that authorization block to the, to the right. Um, and we do have a flap that goes over that signature so people don't have an exposed signature when it's traveling through the mail or through the, the ballot drop boxes. So we're hoping. This cures that and that we don't have 367 voters without uh, signing it. The, the crazy thing about that, though, is that we actually contacted all those voters. We sent them not one but two letters asking for their signature, and they ignored that, too. So I, I think, I don't know what happened, but um, hopefully this will be better. Same day voter registration. So we worked with this um, task force that included people from the ACLU, League of Women Voters, Center for Civic Design, uh, Future California Elections, and we developed a flyer, a brochure. You know, the law requires us to give a receipt to voters if they are voting uh, a, a same day voter registration. So these are voters who missed the deadline uh, to register to vote but still want to vote. So there's a tool for them to do that. We did a news release, talking points, do a lot with social media messaging um, and the images. Uh, I came up with this one here, no FOMO. It was really just targeted toward young people because they tend to be folks that um, don't always make those deadlines. So um, I have a 20-year-old and a 23-year-old, and my 20-year-old really has a fear of missing out. So I, we're really trying to show you didn't miss out. You can still vote. Um, so we kept it simple. If you miss the deadline to register to vote, you can still register and vote on the same day. And then we talk about the easy steps on how to make that happen. So we went through a lot of debate about the law says it's called conditional voter registration. But th that doesn't make sense to anybody. Um, so is it conditional, same day? Who cares? You know, what we want to do is we want to make sure, uh, you know, the voters know what this new law does for you. So we, we use the, the question format, simple, like miss the voter registration deadline. If your answer is yes, you can still register and vote on the same day. So we're giving voters messages that tell them exactly what they need to do. And this one's tailored to Santa Cruz County. You go to one of the following locations. So we have the two locations that are open more days than uh, I put one up at UCSC because, again, that's a population of voters who tend to uh, think about things on the day that they're due. And so that's why we are just up there on Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday for uh, same-day voter registration there. And then we tell them it's simple steps. You register to vote, you vote, you put your ballot in an envelope. Simple. And, and then at the bottom, we kind of get into more like this is called conditional voter registration because maybe they're hearing those terms elsewhere. And then in this flyer, we actually go into a whole FAQ that explains all the details that people wanted to read further. But basically, in the first couple of lines, you, you know what this is about. 
And then we designed a flyer and another social media post to just sort of catch people's attention as far as what's happening with this new law. And those were well received by our voters. And the voter receipts that we use, we, uh, the, the one on the left there is about um, the conditional voter registration, same day registration, using the question format. This is required by law. We have to give a voter a receipt if they're a same day voter registration. And so this explains to them um, what happened, what's happening next, how do I find out if my ballot was counted or not, and then um, you know, why am I doing this? What is conditional uh, voter registration? And then the one on the right, anybody who votes provisionally. So if a voter shows up to vote on election day, and for some reason we cannot determine their eligibility to vote, they're able to vote and we just put it in a pink envelope, but then there's always questions, what does this mean? So every voter by law is required to have a receipt. And again, it just tells them what you need to know about provisional voting, what you just did, this is information you need. And it explains to them what their options are to see whether their ballot was counted or not um, and why they were voting provisionally. Uh, one thing there at the bottom, it tells them that um, they do get to call us to find out their ballot was counted or not, and if not, why not? And it tells them that they have the right to sue me, and it tells them that that lawsuit is free according to the law. So in June, tw uh, the presidential June 2016, am I right? Uh, we had. Um, a presidential primary, and I had a provisional voter who registered as an American Independent Party. Has anybody ever heard of that? It's one, it's one of the uh, minor parties in the state of California, and it is the most conservative political party we have in California. It's similar to the Constitution Party in other states. But when voters register to vote, they see the word American, and they go, yep, that's me. They see the word independent, and they go, yep, that's how I think. And they see the word party, and they said, yeah, I like to do that. So they, they check that box, and they are an American Independent Party voter. And they don't realize they are registered with a political party that has a very conservative set of goals and values. So when they get their, their primary ballot for president, and that's the only time when party matters in the state of California, they get a list of candidates that they've never heard of because these are not the people that are debating on CNN. These are people like Mad Max Reisky, who ran for president. You've all heard of him, right? So they're very upset about that. So this was a woman who wanted to vote for one of the Democratic candidates running for president. She thought she had registered independent, part, independent state of mind and not independent party. So she had to vote provisionally. We gave her the Democratic ballot. But by law, I can't count it because she's registered as an American independent. So what she did is she sued me. She was actually the only one that took me up on the offer to sue me. And I went to court with her. I'm like, yeah, let's go. Let's do this. And she won. The judge said, yeah, it's confusing. Uh, count her ballot and re-register her as an independent, um, no party preference. So we did. So she had great success. And it didn't cost her a cent. She actually went to the law library. And they helped her file, you know, write the writ of mandate she filed. And done. So it was pretty exciting. So that's government working for you. So, um, so anyway, so the bottom line is when, you know, when you're doing this kind of redesigning, it's like remodeling a house. So once you do one room, everything else looks absolutely horrible. And you just keep going until the whole house is done, and then you sell it, right? So, um, but, um, but that's what ends up happening with us. Like, we, this is an ongoing you know, process for us. Everything that we pull out, we pull out manuals, our poll worker training manuals, or, or uh, our voter registration manual. And we see it, and we go, oh my gosh, this is horrible. We need to apply these plain language tools and redesign it. So we're constantly changing. I always tell my staff that the only thing permanent in life is change, so get used to it. Uh, so we're doing a lot of changing and redesigning on everything we're doing. So it's pretty exciting. But all of you here, if you are a voter, uh, I want to encourage you to maybe think about working in the polls on election day, because that's always something we need to do. And if you're not registered, I encourage you to get registered by October 22nd. There's so many online tools now that you can use. There's an online tool to look up your voter status. There's an online tool to track your vote by mail ballot. There's an online tool to register to vote. There's Voters Edge California, which is a new kind of cutting edge uh, online tool to learn about the candidates and the issues. So there's lots of uh, things available online right now. Uh, so take advantage of those things. So anyway, thank you all very much. I don't know what I do with this now.
So actually, before we move on to the next speaker, okay. I wanted to do, I'm doing this backwards, but I wanted to introduce Gail. Okay. <laughs> and just, you know, kind of maybe your role and your responsibility and how you got here as sure. well. So I've been doing election work for 25 years. Um, so I'm old. And um, I started, I actually started, oh wow, okay. Um, I started in Sacramento. I worked for Willie Brown in the state legislature, working in government for a number of years, and then moved to Santa Cruz County and was looking for work. And, um, and I became the elections manager, worked in that position for a number of years. And then when my boss retired, I became the county clerk. And that's an elected position. So I've been up for four terms now. And no one's run up against me yet, so yay, yay. And I got two kids, uh, 20 and a 23-year-old. My 20-year-old goes to UC Davis, and my 23-year-old's in UCLA studying artificial intelligence. So he had a good internship this summer at Wave Computing. It's kind of cool. And my daughter's in communications and managerial economics. And so, but yeah, I love my job. And I also, as, also as county clerk, I'm the commissioner of civil marriage. So I get to do weddings every day. I mean, we do weddings in our office every day, so it's kind of fun. We did, yesterday we were closed, like I said, for Columbus, there were the Indigenous Peoples Day. And, but we were open for voting because it was the first day for voting. And I had this couple call me from Merced County that were desperate to get married on that day for some reason. And they were calling all the counties around and everyone was saying no, no, no. And I said, oh, come on down. So they came down <laughs> to our office and I did a wedding yesterday and did the license and so it was fun. <laughs> No, it's the office of politics and love. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And it takes a huge, I mean, really, election work. We start planning this election months in advance, and all the work that goes into planning and executing a successful election. I mean, there are so many balls in the air right now, and they're all exploding. And uh, it really takes so many people to pull it off uh, with, with the polling places. And on election night, we're there like after the polls close and everybody gets to go home and drink their glass of wine and watch the election results come in. Um, we are working tirelessly and everything's got a chain of custody and security and checks and balances and auditing. And um, so when we do release those results, we're not releasing something that hasn't been checked and rechecked and triple checked. So an election night is just a snapshot. People will go out going, I'm the winner. You're not the winner. We're not done counting the votes. So stop talking. So, um, you know, but that's what happens. People get very excited and they declare winners, but um, things change. We've actually had winners on election night who turned out being losers once we certified and counted all the votes. And with vote by mail now being so popular and so many people voting by mail, and the law now says that if the ballot's postmarked on or before election day and received by the elections official by Friday, I can count it. And then the law changed again and said any ballot dropped off anywhere in the state of California can be, as long as it's dropped off to an elections official, can be counted. So my daughter, on election day, at like four o'clock or five o'clock in the afternoon, said, oh, I have my ballot still, what do I do? And I'm just like, oh, for God's sake. So, you know, here's, she's, she was raised as an election baby, and it's election day at five o'clock, and she wants to know what to do. So, uh, so she voted it, and she was able to turn it into a UC Davis polling site, and then Yolo County got it and delivered, you know, sent it to us, and we were able to count it. So that did, you know, some of those ballots don't get in until like a week or a week and a half later. Imagine Los Angeles County, how many people they have, but they have an army of people too. But, but they get tons of ballots that come in, and then having to sort them out to the other 57 counties that they need to deliver them to, it's, it's, it's quite a job. So that's why it takes 30 days to certify an election. So don't think, I mean, we're not done. It takes a good, like, I think it's December 7th is the deadline for us. So long past Thanksgiving, we're still counting votes. And auditing. The auditing is a huge piece. Any other questions? Q&A later. OK. Do I turn this off now? Or he turns it off up there? Okay. Yes. Thank you, Gail. And if you haven't already, you know, sensed her passion for voting and uh, making it easier for uh, citizens to vote, she's also authored several election guidebooks. Oh, yeah. Um, so our next speaker is Michelle, and she's uh, representing um, San Jose. Um, and I'll let you introduce yourself, and if you can share um, what brought you into this field. Sure, absolutely. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Tong. I am a digital services lead for the city of San Jose. 
Um, gosh, how did I get into this field? I've, I've taken a pretty circuitous path. Um, I started out uh, studying electrical engineering and feminist studies just down the road from here at Stanford. Um, I actually did an internship at Xerox Park looking at um, the role uh, in like why inclusion and diversity was uh, important for the technology field. Again, like 20 years ago, if you told me then that I was going to end up having my dream job in local government, I would have thought you were crazy because I didn't think about local government, I didn't think about what it did for me, I didn't think about it as a place for a career. Um, but uh, sure enough, you know, 20 years later after doing a stint um, as an electrical engineer and a project manager for a company that makes touch sensors, uh, like the ones on your phone and your laptop, uh, oh yeah, um, I, uh, I decided to, um, I really cast around for like a way to give back and I looked at everything from becoming an organic farmer to um, working in corporate social responsibility. Uh, landed on urban planning because I realized that I didn't want to you know, be working in a community that wasn't my own. I wanted to be making pragmatic local changes to improve quality of life. So studied urban planning and then eventually found my way to uh, local government just as things were starting to get really interesting uh, about five to ten years ago with folks looking at how they could apply um, design and agile and practices that had been successful in creating technology products to how government innovates. So uh, after that really fascinating look at the world of voting, we're going to take another look at a different side of local government, which is sort of the day in, day out service delivery and how uh, user centered design is affecting that world. Um, and the specific topic that I'm going to talk about is what a pothole reporting app teaches government about designing for residents. Uh, first, I'd love to get like just a quick poll of who's in the room. Uh, let's see, raise your hand if you consider yourself to be a UX professional or aspiring UX professional. Okay, most people in this room, welcome to any, any of you who aren't. Um, raise your hand if you've worked in government before or closely with government. Oh, okay, so like 30 to 40%. Um, raise your hand if you're interested in the public sector as a potential place, the industry that you would work in. Um, and raise your hand if you, like me, uh, at one time in my life, just sort of don't really think about government, except when you're voting, of course. Yeah, yeah that's normal, too. So I'm going to quickly just bring everyone to a baseline of like some local government 101 context. And then the meat of the talk is going to be lessons from my San Jose, which is the city of San Jose's pothole reporting app. And then I'm going to end with a quick plug on getting more involved in government uh, for those of you who are interested in that. OK, so local government 101. Uh, anybody here from the city of San Jose? Excellent. Welcome. Um, San Jose is, uh, I feel, no one that I went to Stanford with actually lives south of Mountain View, so I feel like it's sometimes forgotten by people who live on the peninsula or north, but it is actually the largest city in Northern California, um, both by population and also by landmass, which actually makes for a lot of service delivery challenges. Uh, we're more than three and a half times the physical size of San Francisco, for example. Um, but besides that, San Jose, like most local governments, whether it's a smaller city like uh, Palo Alto or Redwood City or Atherton or San Jose, Oakland, San Francisco, um, are responsible for a staggering range of services, like literally from A to Z. I'm not going to read everything here, but like we have an airport where we're responsible for the security and safety of over 11 million passengers a year and all of the cargo and planes that travel with them. 
On the other hand, we also do like story times multiple times a week at different libraries throughout um, the city, while also handling over half a million police emergency calls, um, all the way down to filling potholes and caring and feeding for like an alligator and a tortoise in the zoo in a way that children can enjoy when they go visit. So that's a really big range of services, which is like both a really exciting opportunity if you're a service designer and you want to make those experiences better. Um, but it can also be really daunting because that's like an incredible diversity of uh, users and context that you need to nail, right? Most of the companies that we think about as being really excellent at, um, you know, design really only have like one major product or experience that they're nailing. I mean, even Amazon, which sells everything, they're mostly nailing like click a button and then delivering it to your door. Uber is nailing the experience of ordering like a vehicle from your phone and having it show up. But that's like, there's really a very core competency that they're focused on, whereas in government, we have this huge range of services. And to go with that, we have staff that range from um, you know, uh, the police and fire, to librarians and the libraries, um, to folks who are repaving the roads. Um, and as you can imagine, um, almost none of them, like fewer than you can count on your hand, would consider themselves um, user experience uh, designers or researchers. And probably, like, honestly, less than 100 of them have maybe even ever heard of that term. So that, that now we're getting more into like from the exciting to the daunting challenge. Um, so the question for the team that I'm on is, well, how might we scale innovation across this organization, across throughout our local government, um, given our wide range of services and the staff of over 6,000 people that we have across all of these services? Um, to put things in perspective, I work on um, a team uh, called the Office of Civic Innovation and Digital Strategy. We're nine people. So relatively speaking, that's, that red dot is the size of our team compared to the rest of the organization. Um, we fit in an elevator. <laughs> so when your innovation team for an organization that runs all those services with six, over 6,000 people fits in an elevator, one of the things that we figured out pretty quickly two years ago when our team started is that we have to be really intentional about what we work on in order to demonstrate impact. And so we've used this as a guiding principle. It's that, you know, we don't want folks in the city to think that innovation is something frilly. We really want them to understand that taking a user-centered approach is something that you apply to Th problems that are important because they're, they impact a lot of people or they're causing people pain. It's core to the work that a city government should do. And improvements in the experience are achievable at scale with technology and process improvement. I think voting fits perfectly in the sweet spot of that Venn diagram. And um, I also happen to think that a pothole reporting app fits uh, perfectly in the sweet spot of that Venn diagram. Um, because of the size of our workforce, we've also distilled what we think of as the core practices of innovation into three behaviors. And those are champion the customer. We use the word customer because we think it's a little more familiar to our colleagues than user. Uh, learn through data and iterate to improve. So now the meat of my story is going to be about that pothole reporting app. It's, we call it My San Jose. It launched about a year ago. And it's not just for reporting potholes. There's four other services uh, that you can report. You can report graffiti, broken street lights, um, illegal dumping, so like a couch that gets dumped on the street, um, as well as abandoned vehicles. And you can also just place general requests. But those are like the six highest requested services from our call center before we launched the app. Before we had the app, there was uh, no centralized way to report all of those things. You would have to go to the phone book or a website, look up the specific number of the pothole team or the abandoned vehicle team and call them. Um, so this was a big step for our city. At the same time, if you follow civic tech, you'll know that like pothole reporting apps are nothing new. Like we weren't disrupting pothole fixing. Um, how many of you have reported a pothole through an app before? 
couple of you. Have, have any of you ever called about problems? No, you guys just aren't the civic complainers. We'll get to that <laughs> later. Anyway, the point is, pothole reporting apps aren't new, but there is a lot of service design involved, and there is a lot that our organization is still learning about what it takes to deliver services digitally in a resident-centered way. Um, we had a pretty good first year. Uh, all these dots are places where people reported uh, problems through the app. So you, there are a lot of engaged people who wanted to report potholes. None of them are in this room, or a couple of them are in this room. Um, you know, we have an average of almost 500 service requests a day and probably less than 50 staff total in the entire city who are out crossing all 180 square miles of the city responding. So that's like a big, one of our big logistic challenges is just covering this amount of space with a very lean staff. Um, we have over 30,000 users and, and um, many of them ha are using the app through, uh, through the mobile phone. And we heard, you know, residents, some residents who like, they really hate graffiti, they really hate potholes. When they report something and the city comes out and fixes it, it kind of blows their mind. They were like, wow, like I can click this button and the government actually responds. Like my taxpayer dollars are actually doing something. And they feel like it shows the city cares about their corner of San Jose. Like someone dumped a mattress here and the city comes out and takes it away. That's nice. It like is a powerful moment where they're connecting. Um, and it makes them feel hopeful. On the other hand, they're experiencing a lot of frustrations too. When they don't hear back, they're like, ah, oh, government just disappointing me again. Or when we say like, oh, we can't fix that. Can you call this number? They're like, why do you have an app if you're making me call someone? Like, don't tell me to call, just go deal with it. Um, and, and some folks are really just not feeling like the app is really helping them make progress. So we have both gains and pains. And the interesting thing about this project is that you know, government often is afraid of putting stuff out there that gets criticized. And when we put the app out there and people started giving some negative feedback, you know, some people's reaction was like, oh no, people don't like it. But the thing that our team got to do was create this space to like be like, breathe in, breathe out, people are using it, they have feedback, this is valuable. Like, it's not bad that they have feedback. This is something that we can use to make it better. And that alone is a big shift. It's going from thinking about a tech project, like a project that has a start and an end, and then you're done and people either like it or they don't, to being a product that we maintain and iterate on continuously. So here are a couple of quick snapshots of how we're iterating to improve on my San Jose. Um, the first is that UX research is for everyone. Um, what you're looking at is, um, I would say, what is like the largest scale UX testing that has ever happened in our organization, whereby you have about half of a half a dozen city staff sitting in on a remote user interview and prototype test with one skilled facilitator in the room who's sort of showing these other staff what it's like. And these are staff who run back, you know, they're IT staff, they run the parking program. UX is not part of their job description, um, by, but by being able to listen to users, they get to have this moment of epiphany where they're like, oh, like, I don't know what my users think. My users actually think about things differently than I do. And we've seen that putting folks in the room where they can listen to a user um, express their thoughts and their perspectives is much more transformative than I could ever be by delivering a PowerPoint presentation to them, right? It's better to show, not to tell. So here's an example of what we tried. This is a prototype. One of the problems is that when we get a lot of duplicates in the system, um, it slows down our staff's response because they're like trying to sift through this long list of requests and they're like, oh, is that a couch that we already went out to pick up? So we thought like, oh, if we just let residents know it's a duplicate, like they'll be like, okay, cool, no need to report. So we tried this prototype on the left that says like, hey, you're trying to report something. Yeah, we already got it. You want to cancel your submission? And when we showed that to a resident, they're like, no, I want to report it anyway. I mean, this couch is bothering me, and I want you to know, it's it, maybe it was bothering someone else, but it's bothering me, and I want you to know that. And I think the more people complain to you, the faster you're gonna respond. And when they said that, like, 
the, um, there was like a mini epiphany in the folks that were in the room with me because they're like, what? They don't realize that duplicates slow us down? And it's like, no, they want to be heard. So once we had that insight like, oh, our residents want to be heard. <laughs> We need to let them feel heard. We changed the prototype to the one on the right, where it says like, hey, it looks like someone else reported this. Do you want to confirm that it's still accurate, or do you want to um, add more information? Like, you know, add your weight to this, not just like, hey, don't, don't bother us. We already know about this problem. Um, so that's, that's an example of, of how that can shift thinking. The other approach we took like this it, we took with this problem is to think like a multiplier. And that means like, because of the scale of our organization, it's never gonna work for us. We're never gonna be able to hire, frank, quite frankly, enough UX designers to solve all the user interaction problems in our services. We need to start engaging staff and building their abilities to think like their user. Um, so these are a bunch of sketches that were generated from like the IT staff, from the parking officers in that room based on listening to the, the user and then thinking about like, well, what are some creative ways that we could um, think about solving this problem of duplicates in a way that also works for the user? Um, and what that does is it, it unlocks our colleagues from thinking that like the first solution is the best one. With this exercise, they were able to realize like, oh, the first solution isn't necessarily gonna be the one that works and before we invest a lot of time in it, we should probably test it out with our users. Like We're liberated from having to make that decision ourselves because we can actually just see how people respond to it. And that's very powerful. Um, secondly, or thirdly, we need to find opportunities to solve for both residents and government. Um, so you know, we have a set of resident pain points. We also have a, an important set of internal user pain points. Um, and we want to try to focus on like where we can meet both the resident need and the staff need at the same time. And that's particularly important in government because improving the external user's experience does not necessarily, or like very rarely results in increased revenue for more staff on the inside. So just making the user experience better um, can actually lead to more demand, and if you're not solving the pain points on the internal side, then it's actually then going to degrade the user experience. So if we make it really easy to submit reports, and we get so many that the internal staff can't handle it, then ultimately the residence experience is, is not going to be great, um, even if the interface was easy to use. So here's an example of that. Um, where one of the pain points that we found in responding was that um, sometimes people report things like gum wrappers, but sometimes they report things that are like three mattresses and a sofa, and those require different sizes of equipment and different numbers of people. Um, but residents aren't always specifying that. So we made a slight tweak in a prototype on the left where at the bottom it asks the user just to click on an icon to say is this small or is this medium sized or large. Just getting that extra bit of granular data can help the staff when they're triaging to figure out like do we need to send out another truck with another um, crew member out there to help pick up this stuff. And so that's a way we're like making a light tweak that's a little bit more of a burden to the resident but it's actually done in quite an easy, effortless way for them, and then it'll improve ultimately the turnaround time that they experience, because it makes it better for staff too. And what that points to is like one of the biggest challenges that we're experiencing is how do we organize ourselves internally for end-to-end -end service delivery. Um, what this busy diagram shows is that you know, my San Jose is a lot more than an app. It is a digital service that involves a customer facing front end, but all of these pieces that are owned by different silos in our organization. And government is pretty hierarchical and formal, so we're not used to collaborating across those silos in a really agile, iterative way. We're used to going up the decision chain, and we're trying to figure out how do we organize more autonomous, agile teams and, and give them uh, empower them to make the right decisions for internal and external users. 
And finally, one, uh, one thing that's really important for government and really a frontier of this work is um, as we're delivering services based on complaints, how do we make sure that we're doing that in an equitable way and not just diverting our resources to whoever is the squeakiest wheel? Um, so this is a new area for us uh, where we have two user experience research fellows that are spending time not at City Hall, uh, but out in the community uh, trying to understand what our uh, non-English speaking, uh, especially Spanish and Vietnamese residents, what their experiences of My San Jose, if they're using it all, at all, or if they were to use it, what their barriers would be. Um, and, and this is, has been voiced as actually a really important priority uh, inside City Hall as well, because if this is how we're delivering services, we make, need to make sure that we're doing that in a way where we're delivering services to everyone and not just people who are on their phone all day. Um, so my final plug, the public sector needs UX talent like you. Um, you can, if you're interested in like, um, being in the public sector, you can find a job or just a short-term fellowship or even a volunteer opportunity. Um, here are a couple, you know, government, you've got uh, federal groups like the U.S. Digital Service or 18F. Locally, I will put in a plug for the city of San Jose, Oakland, San Francisco. But there's also an emerging vendor space of like user-centered vendors who are, which is an important part of the equation because government works a lot with vendors for our, our digital services, as well as nonprofits who are really pushing the field forward. Um, and if you're not, uh, so it's working. OK. Um, last presentation. And I think uh, what's great about this presentation is it's very complementary to the previous two. And so I think it was, I think it just coincided uh, that it worked out this way. But mine would be more of an overview of how we built and kind of the vision of Civic Design Lab. So to avoid any confusion, not for not center for Civic Design, but it's the Civic Design Lab, which is a civic service design and innovation and kind of research uh, lab that's uh, situated within the City Hall at the City of Oakland. Uh, we've been around for a couple of years now, um, but the idea of Civic Design Lab in Oakland uh, is about six years old. Um, so I was the first employee and you know, basically, I um, just had a chat with uh, this amazing um, former city attorney who was a chief resilience officer, Kieran Jan, and she um, she had a conversation with me. And she's like, "I have this idea for a lab. Would you like to run it?" Uh, so that's kind of how we got how it got started, and now we have a team of uh, five and um, of kind of different flavors of UX. And so we have a content uh, writer, we have a visual designer, a researcher, and a strategist. And uh, we're about to kind of hire two more. So we're hiring a technical director and a design fellow. So for those of you that um, are inspired from tonight's presentations, uh, come talk to me uh, if you'd like to work in Oakland. Um, but. Uh, what fantastic rats basically is is this like mashup of the two words fantastic bureaucrat as you know <laughs> hard for uh, hard for you to believe that is you just saw two fantastic rats um, and you know we are here to uh, basically evangelize um, the practice of design thinking and human centered design in a civic kind of environment and um, we were we kind of started off as an idea to bring kind of agile like you know, you know way to improve existing services as you know, Michelle mentioned a uh, large bulk of the service uh, the work that the the municipal governments do is you know service and policy development and so how do we make that more responsive to the needs of community um, and so like I think another way to think about government is as an enterprise and uh, one of the foundational operation op operating system of our cities so you know um, cities as civic governments are like you know one of the first institutions that came about and is the way that an of our cities form and it will be the last institutions left standing once you know all the tech you know the Buzz, you know, bubble burst and like we're long gone. And so um, I think it's also important to think about like the value that government brings, like it gets a lot of bad rep these days, but like, you know, how can we 
you know, make government functionable again. I think, you know, it's kind of the flip side of like, you know, all the stuff that we see on TV and like on social media and um, like, how can we really, you know, help bring change to that process and like, how do we kind of see the good um, in spite of the bad? Um, and so in Oakland, we do that by kind of sandboxing experiments outside uh, by, you know, so Civic Design Lab is 100% privately funded um, team and we are, you know, purposefully privately funded because it's this idea that, you know, government operates on taxpayers' dollars and who wants to ever fund, like, experiments or um, innovation, this idea of innovation being, like, a big risk that cities have to take on. And so, of course, like, you know, they're not going to do that when, whether, when they're already, like, strapped for cash and, like, they aren't kind of um, operating kind of on a surplus. And if the cities are, then, of, of course, we're going to be suspicious of that as well, right? Because, you know, why are they making profits of taxpayers? Um, but, you know, it works for us, and I think it also um, makes us recognize the fact that, like, innovation is something um, to be kind of held suspect in the context of um, government. And in Oakland in particular, there was an opportunity to create a position called the chief innovation officer, and uh, after some consideration, our mayor, uh, Libby Schaff, um, who is up for re-election in November, she decided uh, that we won't create this position because everybody um, in the, at the city of Oakland is an innovator. Um, and so my background is uh, as, as an architect and um, I work kind of in sustainable design and um, we did kind of what is the equivalent of service design there as well. And I'm showing this picture kind of to lead into a discussion about this kind of concept of embodied energy in architecture. Um, this is a diagram of uh, public finance, um, where you basically start off with a ton of pri um, pu public funds and how, like through kind of leaky kind of pipe syndrome, you lose a lot of kind of uh, value and, you know, optimization and you end up with like very suboptimal um, services that you experience. And so I think, you know, there's, um, there's some, some things to be said about like this diagram and kind of the public perception of how governments operate. But at the same time, you know, what opportunities we do have in fixing those um, leaks along the way. Um, so kind of going back to kind of this idea of like city, cities kind of as the, the, the operating system of, so civic governments as operating systems of our cities and thinking about kind of energies in and energies out, um, where like you have kind of different source, like sources of material where you, you know, pull um, energy and then convert it into something that's useful on the back end. Um, so like you, you're starting to see like where the, um, where, where like attrition of energy happens and then you end up with like this kind of end product of useful energy versus uh, rejected energy, which is waste. And so how can we reduce waste? Like I think in government, we're always thinking about how to make it more efficient. How can we kind of, kind of do more with less? Um, and I think, you know, we can kind of apply this uh, analogy to the way that we think about how we apply innovation in government. And so when you think about like energy, embodied energy being kind of a product of like materials, processes and impact. And so, um, so this kind of like concept of embodied energy has, is everybody else familiar with this concept or? No. Um, so when you think about uh, a product, like maybe, uh, um, maybe a banana, like on a shelf, like you think about, okay, it only costs 20 cents and like, you know, that goes into compost and like we'll recycle whatever, eat it, consume it. Um, but like we don't think about like how much the true cost of a banana is and like how long it's had to travel like across the world from like the Philippines to, you know, in, in terms of like, you know, travel time and um, kind of fuel that's required to transport in, in the tra transportation process. And so from like, you know, fertilizers that's used to, you know, make it grow really fast, like your GMO products, as well as kind of what impact it has on the natural environment. And so when you think about like the products that you touch in the supermarket, um, we often forget about like all the processes that are involved in bringing that product to you. And so when you're interacting with um, large like systems like 
government, like you also want to think about like what else goes into it and um, when you're thinking about like changing something within it, you also want to think about what are the different variables you can play around with to make it more optimum. And so this is kind of something that I've been thinking about a lot in my work um, in terms of the impact that our work has been having in, in the city of Oakland. And there are some things you can't change. And so when you think about um, materials being equivalent to like policies and services, yes, like those are kind of put together by policymakers, by elected officials, by kind of kind of the groundswell of you know opinions that are out there like around what like you know policies we should be pursuing or what policies we should change. Like those things are very high level and some somewhat um, out of touch with the everyday experiences of us as like you know residents and citizens and visitors. So I want to be inclusive and in, like calling out like um, it used to be uh, PC to talk about like you know citizenry, but because it's become somewhat <laughs> controversial, I like to kind of refer to everybody that lives um, comes to Oakland as like residents. Um, and in terms of impact, like you know we can't. There's not much we can change. Like it, it, I mean, you can change public perception of government, but it's a lot of hard hard work, and it takes a long time. So what, you know, what we focus on is this middle part, the process, the procedures to implementation. And kind of, you know, I think it translates well to how policies land in, the, in our communities in terms of like, you know, what do we really care about? Like we don't really care about what the policies say as much as we care about how it impacts us in our daily lives. Um, so this, these are some of our uh, fantasticrats in Oakland. Um, we had kind of a celebratory kind of uh, spotlight session at you know one of the workshops that we had, where we just brought them out and celebrated like the work that they were doing. Um, and I kind of bring that up because I think these are kind of the the unsung heroes of government that you never see. Um, I mean, I think we saw some great presentation today of people that are kind of in the front lines and um, do a lot of work that's highly visible. Uh, but I think a lot of the work that um, we see kind of value in Oakland is a lot of the work that's not seen and not really um, valued as much as like we should. And so we, uh, we do a lot of training of like human-centered design with these folks um, and I mean, I think it, it will take years. I mean, it's not going to be done um, in a day, but I think we, uh, we applied in a way that is um, uh, conducive to like, long-term behavioral change. And so we also see ourselves as kind of being in the business of um, engaging in change management. Um, so we sometimes do that through projects, like in kind of thematic projects that we select around specific community issues, but we also provide technical assistance because often when you're working with public servants, they're, um, they're always like short for time and like, like the, usually the first interaction you have with someone around like, oh, do you want to partner with us on this topic? They say, oh, it must be so nice to have like, you know, be paid to be reflecting. Because, you know, in my job, like we have no time to like have this like luxury. Um, and I think you know it goes to goes to show like you know how much more additional work is required to like have a successful partnership within government and um, kind of the the reasons why our governments are so kind of um, siloed in their operation. Um, it's you know because they just like run out of time like and they have a short list of a thousand other things they have to get done. Um, and this is our methodology. So like everybody has uh, you know brand of uh, design thinking process that they use. Um, I call it like our brand of toothbrush because you know, we don't want to use anyone else's and that's I think how a lot of other people that practice uh, design thinking feel about the pro uh, process that they use. Um, but at the heart of a lot of the work that we do is this concept of uh, race and equity. Like um, Oakland has one of the very, uh, I think one of only two um, directors of race and equity within the city that uh, trains people around the importance of equity um, and what it really means from a, um, the racial lens. And I think um, in Oakland especially, you know, uh, because of our history and our demographic, this is a very um, important conversation for us to have in terms of making sure that the policies and the services that we design are um, inclusive, 
um, and also accessible to everybody. So, um, you know, one thing that I would also like to bring up is the fact that, like, you know, we measure our success um, slightly differently. So when, um, you know, in the private sector, you talk about, like, you know, reaching kind of your 90% of the market and kind of celebrate with, like, you know, whatever market share that you get. But in government, like, it's kind of the reverse. And so if you have 90% of your market, that's considered a failure because you've, you didn't reach the last 10%. And so the way that we, re, we measure success is actually by being really inclusive and actually being really committed to making sure that there are processes in place to be as accommodating um, and as accessible to kind of the bottom 10% of our you know, residents rather than you know, like the first 90%. And, and the reason behind that is because if you make services um, you know, work for the bottom 10%, you're actually elevating the quality of life for everybody else. Um, so this is some of the work that we uh, do. Um, one of our, I guess, trainings, and so we don't talk about trainings, we just call it like, you know, uh, whatever they, they like to call it, whether it's uh, focus groups or, um, you, know, you know, working sessions, like there is kind of a, um, public uh, service speak for like how these gatherings happen. Um, and so I think the other role that I play is as a translator um, to figure out like, you know, the, the languages that are already, land systems and policies that are in, already in place that we can leverage to bring and, um, you know, uh, propagate like this concept of like innovation and design thinking. Um, and so I think, you know, um, in saying that, I think public servants also need uh, to, well, they, they, they will benefit from being kind of trained in like human-centered design and systems thinking and race and equity lens um, to, to improve existing services. Um, and it, you know, we also uh, do it kind of incrementally. And I, I kind of laughed when Michelle brought up her Venn diagram because we have our own as well. Um, <laughs> This is our model for civic innovation and, you know, um, at the in intersection of those three things that I just mentioned. Um, and this is kind of our nor North Star in terms of how we um, hold ourselves accountable and in terms of um, thinking about, like, what impact we're having um, at the city. Another example of... Um, uh, this is like a blueprint, service blueprint. You might have uh, uh, seen something like this um, elsewhere, but like this was kind of our tool for bringing folks from like different uh, stakeholder groups that don't usually um, interface with each other. So um, our other mission is like breaking down silos. And so we choose thematic projects that intentionally overlap across multiple departments. And we bring them into um, you know conversation about a topic that you know they are vested in, and you know bring them, you know bring bring something like this up after you know initial conversations about um, what we hear about you know in this case um, you know uh, youth employment um, in Oakland and you know problems within that so like wherever you see gaps like you know not necessarily the case but like is a way of il illustrating what gaps exist in existing policies and um, processes for serving that particular demographic and just you know making it as transparent as possible so that people can help each other and start to kind of think in more of a collaborative mindset um, and we you know going back to this idea of like being a translator of policy and um, government speak um, we do a lot of these kind of process mapping as well to help people understand what are the implications of a new service, um, as well as you know the kind of impacts a, a, a new policy might have on an existing service. And so uh, there was a state bill, um, AB, AB 503, that um, was signed in, um, by the state last November around the ability to pay. So this idea of um, uh, forgiving like, you know, part, parking fines uh, for, for those residents that meet the certain income criteria. And so we are working uh, with, you know, finance and revenue around, like, you know, what are the policies and not, well, so we have the policy. And this is kind of one of the things that, you know, at municipal level you have to grapple with because these kind of seemingly arbitrary, though well-intentioned laws get um, kind of pushed down to the municipal level from 
um, the state, like we have to still deal with the implementation. Um, and uh, we really kind of have to measure our success against like our ability to kind of bring, bring the benefits of whatever new policies do get introduced um, you know, to the people themselves. And so we work closely with folks um, by kind of providing technical assistance around research, um, uh, providing like user research capabilities, um, data analysis, and just whatever we can from kind of the UX toolkit and beyond to allow them to, you know, work um, more, eff more effectively. And so that's the work that we do um, at a glance, at a very high level. Um, yeah, but I think um, if you're interested in working um, with us, uh, let me know, because we are literally hiring. <laughs> um, but thank you. We are ready for Q&A. Um, if we can have you guys maybe step up here so we can see you. And if you have a question, uh, let me know and we'll hand the mic to you. Questions? Uh, first, thank you so much for all the work you, you are putting in place. Um, it is fantastic. Um, my question is, uh, I was wondering if you looked at other cities in the world that uh, execute uh, these type of initiatives at a very core design-centric level, like maybe Singapore or other places. And, uh, and if you did, what did you learn from them and why and how some of those things can be or cannot be implemented in the States? This one? Hello? Uh, so I, when I first started this job, this was my first, this is my first job in government. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Um, prior to this, I was, of course, an architect, but like, I pivoted and became like a UX consultant for startups and nonprofits. So I had no idea. And so the first thing I did for the first month or so was call everybody including folks in the UK, Melbourne, New Zealand, across, you know, federal, state, local cities, and just, like, canvas, ask them, like, what they're doing, what are, what are you learning, um, what went wrong, like, just give me everything. And so I did that, and out of that, I think, came this realization, like, oh, shit, I have no idea what, like, Oakland needs. But I think what I realized, you know, then, as I do now, is that it, like whatever innovation or like civic efforts, civic tech efforts you bring in, needs to be completely tailored for the cities that you're working in because you're, you know, geographically, demographically, socially, economically, so different and distinct from each other. And so we're also in a time like where a lot of cities are inquiring, like to ask, like how can I start a civic design lab in my city? And so like we get a lot of those kind of um, questions and my response is like, what does your city need? Like you have to start there. Um, that's what I would say. Quick question. Um, so, uh, you know, in voting, there's a certification, voluntary it's called, uh, many states agree about and I, I could imagine, and there's an industry, right? Is there, I could imagine, I know that in Boston they have, you know, pothole apps that actually measure the vibration of your car going over the potholes. So um, are, is there an industry or a sharing process of technology across communities um, where you guys can, you know, borrow each other's apps or buy them or jointly produce them or something? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think there is a community of practice that is, is starting to build, but I think there's a lot more that we could do to leverage each other's learnings. I mean, the, the key pain points that I mentioned for our 311 app, I'm sure San Francisco, Seattle, Oakland, um, Santa Cruz have all experienced those as well. Um, but what I find is that it's hard to 
uh, without, necess without interviewing the people at those organizations and calling them up and saying, how did you deal with it? It's actually really hard to find it written down. Um, right now, the folks who do the sharing are, um, and it's great that they exist, are vendors who you know, create a 311 app for one city and then scale it to other cities and apply their learnings of how to deal with the, those pain points across other cities. And, and there's an interesting debate, um, I think, for a lot of government organizations of whether you know, to build or buy. So you could just buy something that's been proven in other cities. On the other hand, if you want to be able to customize it to the particular needs of your jurisdiction and add features that uh, on your own schedule and not on the, your vendor's roadmap, then you might want to bring it in house and customize it. So it's, it's, you know, to build off what Alexandra said, it's like learning from other cities and then making the decision about when you want to, when you need to do something that's specific to your local context or when it's more advantageous to, you know, do what other folks are doing. And just at the county level, we have a state association and we're constantly sharing best practices and ideas and working with the different collaboratives and groups and organizations. So. Um, I was very interested in uh, one of the aspects of the feedback for the uh, San Jose app, saying that it sort of highlighted the lack of funding and lack of ability to deliver. Do, do you find that in creating these apps that often have sort of uh, the appearance of greater uh, transparency into the process that that can highlight just the sheer limited resources that are available and and what do you do about that because sometimes the opacity of like oh it's being worked on can actually be slightly more satisfying than knowing we know we just can't do anything yeah that's a really interesting question and an area that we want to explore more this coming year um, with uh, some more you know prototyping and testing so for example um, We've experimented in prototypes with saying like, oh, thanks for reporting your number 99 of 200 requests we received today, you know, but we're working on it. Um, or, or also maybe saying, hey, you, you know, you've reported 50 potholes in the last year and there's a ballot measure going, you know, that's up uh, in, you know, in front of voters in a month's time that's you know, a bond to pay for repaving of our roads. So do you want more information so you can share it with your neighbors? Or like ways that we can take some of that engagement and move people up the ladder of engagement. Those are some really interesting questions that, um, is, that's an example of a type of feature that isn't in an off the shelf 311 app but that we would like to be able to experiment with. As an immigrant uh, non-voting resident <laughs> um, who won't be able to vote for probably quite a long time, uh, do any of you have any experience with uh, engaging non-citizens in civic processes? Well, if you're a legal permanent resident, you can work in the polls. <laughs> but can't vote, right? Huh? But can't vote, right? Right. Right. But it's fun to work and you get taken. Yeah. So you get a small stipend. So Oakland is a a very vocal, like at a national level, in terms of protecting immigrant rights, and our, our mayor um, is actually because of what she did when, like, the ICE were in town. Uh, the Oval Office is in a process of creating Libby Law to actually put her in jail, and so this is kind of like a facetious way of saying it. But I think you know when we. Um, run projects like it is like we kind of take those concerns into consideration like in employment like in in terms of like you know visas or uh, social security information that you need we discuss like how do we make the process more inclusive and how do we kind of you know maybe turn the other way when like that doesn't need to be a, a requirement for the purposes of helping that person kind of thrive and like be, become like uh, an integral contributor to society and so I think, you know, we like we were very, very fortunate in that, like a lot of the public servants that I've worked with have that mindset of being very inclusive and understanding that like, you know, like just because of somebody's um, visa status doesn't mean that like can't participate in social services or, you know, benefit from, you know, what is intended to kind of lift all of our communities up. And so um, Oakland is kind of a very special place like that. Like we'll take everybody's heart if you kind of spend a moment just you know getting to know how like uh, compassionate of a city it is, um, even though it has a ton of challenges too. 
This might be a really dumb question, but what is the reason they don't ask for ID when you go voting? <laughs> I, I, I still don't get that. Well, in some states you do, they do have ID, but California has been a, been a no ID state because really there's, it's not preventing, it's causing a, a poll tax because it does require someone to spend money to have the ID and uh, it causes lines at the polls and it doesn't really give you anything, it doesn't benefit anything. So when voters come in, they have to recite their name and the address where they live and then they sign in under penalty of perjury. So the, the, I think the statistics of somebody impersonating a voter at a polling site is uh, so minuscule. I mean, it's, you could be hit by lightning twice before that would even happen. So it's pretty just, it's just not something there, people there's do. A, there's a big history in this, and it was used as sort of voter suppression. Yeah. That's why they overturned it. And the states that have required ID, what we found is that they'll close DMV offices in the poor minority communities so they can't even get to the place to get the ID. So yeah, it's definitely something that curtails voters and, and it really hits minorities and seniors who don't always have the ID. Okay, thank you. I have one question. Well, actually, I think somebody else has a question, so you can go first. <laughs> No, no, you go for that first. <laughs> I feel like I've been using the mic. Um, so my question was about, um, you know, for Gail, uh, when the um, redesign of the um, voting information, um, it felt like it was all about uh, communicating the right information in the right places. Uh, I was curious what prompted that, um, and like, because it's, it seems like, you know, it happened a few times, you know, how, how does that come about? Sure, well, it started with the State Voter Information Guide and uh, the Center for Civic Design was working with them on making it clearer to voters and organize the material more so people find it where they're looking for it. Um, and then they did a project for the County Voter Information Guide and I was one of three counties that jumped on it because I just thought it was very exciting work. So Shasta County, Orange County and myself took part in a pilot project to do it. And then we went and trained all the other counties on how to, to do the design. And the Center for Civic Design has a whole section on their website of the templates that we use and, and icons and everything's just free for people to just you know download and use. So it's definitely easy to use. But, but it created some challenges too because what we do now, um, everybody has a different ballot style depending on where you live. So in this election I have 76 different ballot styles. So when you look up online your voter guide, it's got to pull up the right voter guide for you with the right information. And every voter guide will have different measure information or candidate statements. And so to build these guides for printing, we put them together into PDF files and, and organizing uh, the different sections and then we save it to a PDF file, and then we want our the sample ballot to be the centerfold that they can extract, and because it's a long ballot, and putting it vertical is just something that they can't really read very well. So we've gone through a lot of growing pains on that. So what we end up doing is actually creating these voter guides with blank pages in the middle, and then going into the PDF program and setting up the page numbers and the footers, and um, and doing that, you know, 76 or 113 times, depending on how many ballot types we have. But then we take that voter guide and we want to post it on our website, but it doesn't make sense having your sample ballot be in a centerfold when it's electronic. So we do a whole other set of guides and do the sample ballot at the end of the voter guide. And the worst part about all that is it's not accessible because PDF is not accessible to people who use screen readers. So I work with the Voting Accessibility Advisory Committee in trying to make our voter guide materials more accessible. And what we've ended up doing is just really using a Mac and doing um, audio files. But it's not specific to ballot types. So uh, it's a right now it's a big challenge for me to figure out how to do these voter specific guides that are easy to, to download online and also accessible to, to people. So if anyone has any great ideas about that, I'm open to it. Um, <clears throat> so I know social choice theorists, they've been looking into different voting systems because they tend to hate our current voting system. Which one is it? Uh, social choice theorists, like people looking into like ranked choice or oh, yeah, uh, yeah. approval voting or things right, like right. this. 
Um, and I've heard that they've had to balance uh, actually like counting people's votes and like coming up with good systems with uh, coming up with systems that they can actually communicate to people. Um, so I'm wondering uh, if you have any perspective on this, like what sort of systems might be, uh, like how, how you might actually uh, communicate a new type of voting system to a person and like uh, what systems you think might be good. Yeah, it's challenging. Uh, well, the reality is that in California, any voting system I purchase has to be federally qualified and state certified. So if I were to go to the voting system store today, there's only one system on that shelf that I could purchase because there is nothing else that's been federally qualified and state certified. Our current voting system cannot accommodate ranked rank choice voting, so it's not an option. The system that's currently for sale can do ranked choice voting. Um, and then I'm hearing proposals now for proportional voting, and there's just a lot of other creative ideas on how to actually cast votes. And, and um, I think any time, so we are, will be changing our voting system in 2020. It's not my ideal to change a voting system in a presidential election year, but I really don't have any alternative because the system we have now is no longer sustainable because we, we're, we're buying parts on eBay uh, because it's just, the way it's certified is I can't put a new part in it, I have to use the old part, you know, and I have to find it somewhere out there. Um, it's insane. So, um, so I mean, there's gonna be lots of changes ahead, and if we do go with this vote center model, there's a whole election administration plan and outreach plan that we have to do, including two direct mailers to every single voter and, and all languages and all accessibility. And, so it's a huge undertaking to move to a vote center model, but we're hoping to do it with our support of our voters. Small, small comment. Because we're definitely doing a user interface group to make sure that they're part of the, the whole transition. So the history of what you're talking about is very interesting. And there are places where people have, like in Brazil, put out the voting machines in public places for months in advance and, in, and done big outreach to, and then had very good um, experiences with first time a new technology rolls out. In general, when a new technology rolls out in voting, you have a gigantic, uh, what's called a residual. That's that's when people go in to vote and don't actually succeed at voting. Um, and so that that it's it's a it's a it's an ongoing process to get people educated. Um, and meanwhile, back at the ranch in Ireland, for example, they've used proportional voting for decades. And when anyone went to change even the way it looks. Uh, people freak out because they love that that process there, but it's just, and there is it's, San Francisco well, well, does. Well, and we moved from a punch card system. I mean, I I took the job in 1993, and our first big election we had uh, the Chads were flying out of the voting uh, vote counting devices. I'm like, what is that stuff? And I quickly learned about the whole Chad issue and the hanging Chad issue. So. I converted voting systems in 1995 to a mark system where a voter actually marks a ballot with their choice. And I had people punching holes in their ballots with a hole puncher for 10 years after that. I'd get ballots in with hole punches. So, um, and, and, and just but being out in the community, we're, we're very engaged. We like to go to all the different festivals and um, you know, uh, go to different groups and organizations. We're out uh, big right now in the high schools and educating uh, young folks. We actually work with a school that's doing a, a kids vote program that's gonna be at the polls on election day. So we really try to get everybody involved. Our, our latest fun thing is that Discretion Brewery has a new label called Participate with the IPA, you know, large, and they have the label as a flag and the star part is actually a QR code that takes you to online voter registration. So we're, we're, we're using whatever tools available to get there the word go. out about voting. Yeah. Um, so maybe it's getting late, but if there's one more question, um, okay, there is. So, I'll let you, yeah. Hi, um, this question is mainly directed at Michelle, just because you kind of mentioned bringing in uh, other employees kind of into the whole user research experience. And I'm wondering how much you find that that's sticking and, and taking with them. Um, because I feel like particularly for those who are working kind of front lines and interacting with your customers, so to speak, they would have so much insight and valuable knowledge for, for what customers are looking for. Yeah, that's a, um, a great question and a great point. Um, I've found that um, 
you know, employees, frontline, mid-level managers, and even executive staff, you know, respond uh, really well to, you know, just having someone create the space for them to deal with, you know, residents as, to understand their residents as, you know, as users and not be in the role of addressing a complaint or having to issue a regulatory judgment, but be just trying, having the space to like see our services from their resident or business perspective. And uh, um, we found that, that that is very powerful because their, you know, their day job is usually is seeing things from the role of government and not from the role of the resident. Um, I think we still have a ways to go in terms of embedding user research practices so that it feels like a normal thing that a, a staff person could do to just walk into the lobby of City Hall and maybe ask someone a, co a couple questions. Um, like just having them feel like that's something that, that they can learn how to do and do for themselves in a lightweight way is a big thing. And then um, another thing is creating a more, in, uh, some sort of framework or process by which the, you know, all the voice of the customer feedback that the frontline employees are hearing every day is being funneled into some, you know, productive backlog of service improvements that we can work on. Because otherwise what happens is we're putting a lot on frontline customer service and they feel the burden of all the ways in which our process isn't working, um, but they feel powerless to fix it. And that results in them feeling very disempowered and overwhelmed and frustrated. So I think we really need to find ways to organize for improving that end-to-end -end experience in a way that empowers the frontline workers. Um, well, uh, I think we've got a lot of questions for you, and it's you are fantastic crats. It's obvious. Um, it's really important work you do, and I'm really excited about you sharing all of the the grit of of, of the hard work that goes on. And I, I bet some of us still want to talk to you some more, but it's getting a little late. Maybe, maybe we should take it off, offline. Is that all right? Thank you so much for coming.